Uh, hello and welcome to another episode of Positive Parenting with Astrology. I am your host and resident Gemini Maria Rieger and we're here today with a very special guest who has a lot of really good information for parents and kids. Carly Myers, who is the founder of the Stress Less Company, and I'm really excited about this because this is an area that everyone, literally everyone on the planet could pretty much benefit from. So I want to talk to Carly, who's a speaker and an expert on reducing and managing stress about how we can deal with this in general. So first, Carly, I want to welcome you. Thanks so much for your time today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. I'm very excited to have you here. I wanted to start first with asking you how you got involved in this type of work. What led you to found the company? Um, you know, we always are talking on this channel uh, with uh, about how you know our childhood affects our adult relationships, including our relationships with our kids. And you have some you know very tough childhood experiences. And I'd love to hear about how kind of how you dealt with those. That's something that our audience would really, you know, benefit from hearing, I think. Yeah, I know when we initially connected, I, I warned you that it was sort of a can of a worms, can of worms type of story. And yeah. and that's the truth. And, and I would like to give just a little bit of warning that it could be um, a trigger warning for some. But, you know, the reason that I got into the line of work that I got into is because of an experience I had when I was about 12 years old. Um, my mom ended up. Uh, well, we'll back up uh, and just give you high level here, which is that a man ended up breaking into my childhood home and killing my mom's new boyfriend and trying to kill my mom. And while my mom basically made a miraculous recovery, I ended up struggling for a long time. I struggled with, you know, the symptoms of PTSD, stress, jumpiness, night terrors, nightmares, um, anxiety. I mean, you name it. I was probably struggling with it. And for a long time, I didn't, I didn't tell anyone what was going on with me. And when I finally did open up, you know, it was on one end, I might ask for advice. And when I would ask for advice, I'd get the same five or so responses every time, right? Hey, have you tried therapy? Have you tried yoga, meditation, changing your diet, hitting the gym, right? Like the things we've all heard. And the reality for me was that I had tried those things and it was frustrating, incredibly frustrating to hear those same solutions when they weren't getting me to that beautiful state of mind. And, and it felt like, ah, oh, do you think I've been living under a rock for the last you know, decade? Come on, give me a break. And so there was that side of the spectrum. And, and that was if I was courageous enough to ask for help, which I often wasn't. Um, other times I would, I would just kind of go into relationship and I would share. And it depended on the person. The, the intentions were always good, but on one end, I might receive unsolicited advice, advice I didn't even ask for, which um, if we know anything about unsolicited advice, it's considered criticism. It's received as criticism. Um, I always joke that I need to get like a line of t-shirts made that say unsolicited advice is criticism because it happens all the time. But on the, you know, in a different interaction, I might have received from somebody what? Like, you're still dealing with this? It's been X amount of time. Come on. Right? So then there was this shaming of the experience. Um, and then there were, you know, there was another group of people that might just be like, kind of brush it off. Oh, come on. Let's just, let's go have a good time today. Let's just make today a great day. And so what I learned in my journey was that not only, um, do our relationships either help or hinder our ability to grow um, and heal? Um, I, in that journey, wasn't willing to accept that low-grade misery as my new normal. And so I kept exploring. And I finally figured out the, the you know, tool belt, the toolbox of tools that really worked for me, that worked for me uniquely. And so, um, anyway, long story short, I ended up creating the Stress Less Method and the Stress Less Company to meet that need, to talk about, okay, what can we do to remedy our unique experience of stress? And also, how can we nurture relationships in our lives that help us heal and don't create this compounding effect? 
Um, and I always like to speak to this, just like compound interest is in the bank account, right? We put money in and we might get that compound interest. Our money starts to make money. The same thing can happen in our relationships. We can come to someone with an experience of stress or trauma or trouble. And if we aren't received, and same thing with love or excitement, something, how many of us have ever gone to somebody really, like with something really exciting? And if we're not received, there's this compound, compounding effect of our pain. Yeah, that, that really resonates because it reminds me of what Gabor Mate talks about when he talks about healing from childhood trauma. Yeah. And, and it, he says that, um, to your point, children are not, children do not suffer um, or not traumatized because they suffer um, through traumatic events, right? Because they feel pain. They are traumatized when they are alone with the pain, when they are alone with the hurt. It's almost impossible for somebody to reach adulthood and not have some traumatic event happen that causes them emotional pain. Hopefully not as extreme as what you experienced um, because no child should have to experience that, but some traumatic event on some level where they feel a lot of deep hurt. So that's the key, I think, and it, it is not allowing children to be alone with the pain. And that's why emotional availability for the par from the parents is so important. You know, and that breaks my heart to hear about your experience as a kid where you felt like when you did reach out, people did not validate that and they it, it felt like a brush off to you. I'm not saying that was the intention of the other person. Yeah. And I remember, um, you know, my father died when I was 11, like, tra like in a, an accident. So it was a very sudden thing. And I remember as a teenager telling my mother, you know, I, f I am going through this right now where I feel I remember dad and I feel sad that he's not here. And my mother literally said to me, you know, you should be happy because we have a good life and we go on trips and we do all these things. And, you know, you're missing the point. And now as an adult, I think, you know, a kid could be grateful for what they have in their life. Anybody could be grateful for what they have and simultaneously feel bad for, you know, feel bad for those things. Not that they don't feel grateful for what they have, but they can still feel bad because they lost a parent or for, or they didn't feel heard. Mm -hmm. Those things are not mutually exclusive. Right. Yeah. So that's an important something important to just because you have, you know, an abundance of resources does not mean you don't need more than that. Right. Yeah. Well, that's the interesting thing about grief specifically is that when we think about grief, so many of us think about, um, oh, it's just sadness. Right. Um, it's it's or it's just this awful feeling, whatever that awful feeling is. But grief, what makes grief so interesting and complex is that it's oftentimes two opposing or many opposing feelings. For instance, you know, an example might be we have a family member who passed away from a chronic illness and maybe we were their caretaker, right? On like one end of the spectrum, we're deeply sad, maybe even devastated that they're gone. But on the other hand, we're relieved because maybe that the caretaking was a lot um, or maybe we're, on the other hand, grateful because they're finally not experiencing pain anymore. And so what do we do to reconcile these two emotions? Because most people are assuming we're in devastation, we're in we're sadness and, and that. But there can be this, uh, you know, this dichotomy, this um, kind of counterbalance of emotions that are happening within us. And that's right. where shame can come up. I shouldn't right. be feeling relieved. I shouldn't right. be feeling this, right? Right. And it's not a linear process. You may work through some stages and ha you know, be happy for a while and then you may think about things again and may be sad or may, you know, alternate between sadness and, and grief and acceptance and shame. I mean, you can go back and forth. So it's important to honor that experience. Yeah. Right. And um, and yeah, and he also brought up something um, interesting that, you know, I study positive psychology and one of the main tenets is well-being is more than just an absence of illness. It is more than that, right? Mm -hmm. So so um, it's important to even when we're going through dark periods and learning to deal with that to kind of work on that well-being part too, right? And that's, that's tough. Like when I talk about 
parents who have lost kids and loved ones, I mean, I can't imagine what that's like. And that's really tough to still be here and have to deal with that. And these are things that you don't get over. Like you were saying, some people would respond to you like, are you still thinking about that? It was in the past, but you never get over instances like that, you know, trauma like that, but you can get past it and integrate it into the self so that it's not, you know, holding your, you back from your future self, your authentic self, right? Yeah. So that's, those are all, yeah, really, this is why this process is so important. So, so what, what would you recommend to parents who are, are working with their kids on, you know, their kids have experienced really traumatic events and they're helping their kids kind of get past that so that they can have well-being. Like, what's the first thing you would recommend that they, that they work on? Yeah. So I would say, you know, one of the things that I teach all of my clients, the process that I teach all of my clients is the stress less method. Right. It's five steps. And the, the very, very first step and the stress less method, before I dig into it, the stress less method is really about your experience of the self. What is, what is going on in here? Um, so in order to really show up as the person you want to be, the parent you want to be, the employee you want to be, the business owner, I mean, it goes across the board. Uh, but in this instance, the parent that you want to be, you got to start with that first step, which is manage your energy. And that's sort of a fancy way of saying, or a more woo way of saying, calm your nervous system. So it's likely that if your child has gone through something traumatic, you are also, if you didn't also go through it with them, you are having a response to that experience of them, right? It's, it's almost like secondhand trauma. And so the first thing we want to do is we want to make sure that we are calming our nervous system so that our baseline is grounded. So um, one of the things that I like to talk about here is, you know, when we're in fight, flight, freeze, or faint, when we're in the lower part of the brain, the reptilian part of the brain, this is, we're in just survival mode. Do anything. We're very reactive. It's, I mean, let's just get through the next second kind of mode. We want to activate. And so when we're down here in the reptilian part of the brain, we want to activate the upper part of the brain. So what we want to do is we, we want to get up there because this is where we have access to creative solutions. This is where we're able to connect more. This is where curiosity lives. This is a more grounded place for us to be in. So we want to get into that place so that when we're in conversation with our children, we're able to be curious. We're able to respond rather than react. We're able to hold space. The other thing that I like to talk about when it comes to the nervous system is that each of us has a baseline. Right? And so, you know, if we have a healthy, regulated nervous system, our baseline is some version of contentment, groundedness, peace, whatever that looks like. It can be different for every person, but it's a general sense of groundedness, we'll say. And when we experience a trigger, a stressor, our nervous system will respond ac accordingly. So our baseline will be raised. Now, likely if we have a, a grounded nervous system, our baseline will be raised to anxiety. We'll get the heart rate, the armpits might be sweating, you know, we'll be hyper tunnel focused. We'll have that nervous system response. And there's a time and a place for that. It's very useful in survival. But if our nervous system baseline is not calm, is not contentment or groundedness, and our baseline, we're going through day to day, our baseline is anxiety. Well, what happens when we experience a stressor, a trigger. Well, then we go from anxiety to panic or anxiety to uh, meltdown, right? And so our, because our baseline is at a higher, uh, we'll call it like a higher, higher, faster vibration, we're already kind of amped up, it can send us over the edge. So the first thing that I always recommend is figure out what it is that you need to do to get your baseline back to contentment, to groundedness. Um, and there's so many different ways that we could do this. One of the, you know, one of the first tools that I recommend to my clients, and you mentioned this earlier, is you, you mentioned emotional availability. I would say to get to emotional availability, we have to be emotionally sober. So emotionally sober means I'm willing 
to, to see what I'm feeling, to name what I'm feeling, and, and also to acknowledge what is the compulsion that's going to come out of that feeling for me. So what is the reaction that I want to have? And then also, okay, maybe what's the response? So emotional sobriety can look like that. It's seeing the feeling, naming the feeling, acknowledging the compulsion. Because the compulsion is likely your reptilian brain. It's not that upper part of the brain. Um, and, you know, to take it a step further, maybe the response is, and I would encourage the response to be as much as we can, rather than react, reaction, the response to be compassion for that emotion, to let it be there. Because when we let it be there, it'll move through. And if we resist it, they say mm -hmm. what, what we resist persists. Right. Right. Yeah. I always talk about on this channel, that's the healthy way to deal with emotions, right? As you recognize it and you name it, you sit with it and you let it go, right? But by repressing it, as you suggested, it eventually, you know, that's going to take a toll. The repressed emotions take a physical toll in the body. We, I mean, we know that now. Yeah. <laughs> we know and that's a fact. Yeah. It's, you know, they yeah. either, they say like emotions are energy in motion, right? And so mm -hmm. we, if we stop the motion of the feeling of the right. emotion, then it, you know, that's when we run into it coming out sideways because it just needs to come mm -hmm. out. Right? right. So we're snapping at the slightest thing. Or, or crying at the drop of a hat, right? Inconvenient times, our emotions start to come out. Or we look at, you know, this is where some of the scientific studies of stress, the impacts of stress on the body start to show, you know, if we experience chronic stress, we're not letting the emotions move through us. Right. Then we're looking at, you know, some of the smaller symptoms like headaches or tension in our muscles and our body. But we could also go to the extremes of, you know, cardiovascular issues, heart attacks, strokes, reproductive issues, um, studies have shown that, you know, the symptoms of menopause um, and menstruation are more severe for women um, with chronic stress. Uh, for men, their sperm count is lower. It impacts our digestion both ways, whether we're constipated or it's just moving too smoothly. And so there's many ways that stress and, and suppressed emotions impact the body. Absolutely. Yeah. So when... I mean, some stress is inevitable and a little bit of stress, you know, may be good. Like for me, you know, sometimes when I, when I have a looming deadline, like now <laughs> I have a deadline for a speech I'm doing at the end of the month. Um, I'll, you know, if I wait to the last few days, I'm more motivated to do it and it'll get done. Mm -hmm. Not the last minute, the last few days. So some of, sometimes that impetus is helpful, right? A little yep. bit of stress is helpful. So how do people... I guess what's a good way for somebody to recognize, okay, I have, the stress is becoming too much and it's becoming harmful because we don't want to wait. I mean, we don't want to wait until you have physical problems or cardiac problems or chronic migraines to do something about it. What's, what's a good kind of rule of thumb of like, especially for, for parents to think, well, I need to do something about this now before it gets out of hand. Like, like yeah. at what point is it, do you have to recognize, is it a good time to recognize the stress is too much? Now it's affecting my daily life or my relationships. I need to manage this now. Yeah. I mean, we are, we, I would look at those symptoms first okay. because that'll be your red flag indicators, right? Um, that it's time to do something yesterday. Um, but also, you know, I like to, to talk about, um, emotions as, a, as an indicator. I think we all have an emotional guidance system. And so when we're experiencing emotions, they are our indicator as to whether our life is um, manageable, feels manageable to us or not. You know, one of the, the definitions of stress is, you know, it's really it speaks to whether or not we feel that we have the resources to, man to manage or handle whatever challenge is in front of us. And so I, I guess we could take it a step further and say, if there's something in your life that you feel is unmanageable, that you feel you don't have the resources to handle, like you don't have the connections or you don't have the money or you just don't have the oomph that you feel like you need, that's an indicator that it's, it's time to start um, working methodologies like the stress less method um, or even just asking yourself, what is it that I need to calm down right now? Right. Um, 
Yeah, I would say that's a really great starting point. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I I talk a lot on this channel about parents and emotional regulation because most of the parents who watch this channel are like us, have had significant childhood trauma and are relearning, you know, uh, trying to, to work on those, you know, the negative conditioning that they received as kids so that it doesn't affect their relationships moving forward, especially their relationships with their children. Um, and that's one of the biggest questions I get is, is how can I regulate emotionally as a parent? Because parents, and I was this way too, are, were easily triggered by, by especially behavior that the kids do that are developmentally normal, but that the parent as a kid would get punished for, mm -hmm. right? So that was a, the biggest thing for me. And I realized that if I kept reacting, like overreacting when my kid came to me with something, eventually he was going to stop coming to me and eventually he was going to stop wanting to communicate with me or seeking guidance for me. And that was a huge wake up call. I had, I remember the day, even before I undertook any formal training, I remember the day I thought I have to figure out how to regulate emotionally. He, my son was like five. I thought I have to, I have to regulate emotionally or this is not going to work or I'm just yeah. not going to be able to parent at all. Yeah. And my kid's not going to get what he needs from me. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah, that's the, that's the key is learn to emotionally regulate, especially when the kids come to talk to the parents and tell them something they know the parents are not going to like. <laughs> and, and kids are going to do things we disapprove of. It's just going to, it's the case. They're going to do it, especially teens, right? They just don't, just the way the teen brain is, is crazy. Like, why yeah. would you do that? Yeah. Because they're impulsive. That's what they do. <laughs> so they're going to do things we disapprove of. So it's all about how the parents respond when the kids come to you with, yes. with whatever, right? Yeah. So that's, I mean, I, we really cannot overemphasize the importance of the emotional regulation. And like Bessel van der Kolk says, that's the hallmark of the traumatized child is the adult who is emotionally dysregulated. Yeah. And, it, and it's, you know, I would say like, you know, for those who are listening, who are like, ah, if this feels like a feat that I, I can't accomplish, right? It, I mean, because I know what it's like to have big emotions and it's, and I feel, I know what it's like to feel completely powerless over them. Um, just know that, you know, if you put in the work that it may not happen overnight, but it is possible to slowly but surely learn how to regulate your own emotions and you know we could look at it you know I want to parent my child but maybe first I need to parent myself which is one of those things that if someone were to say that to me I might roll my eyes <laughs> a bit but there's truth True. Yeah. in the statement that I need yeah. to parent myself give be the parent that I needed for myself give myself compassion give myself safety give myself space to play and be adventurous whatever it was that I needed and still need I can do that Right, exactly. Yeah. I mean, if you're not, if the parent is not, you know, in a place, it doesn't work if the parent's not in a place where they can parent the kid. And if you have to do what you need to do to get there. And if that, if that is sitting and relaxing for most of the day until you get the kid gets home from school once in a while, that's what it is. I tell, I've told people before, you know, I, my childhood ended at age 11 when my father died. Cause I was the, I'm the oldest of three. So it was like, well, now you can take care of your, of your siblings and when I got my driver's license, well, now you can take your siblings to school and take them around. So my childhood, like, effectively ended at age 11. So I'm like a big kid now. I, I, I like to do fun stuff. <laughs> and the way I deal with that is, okay, in the morning, I make a list of the stuff I have to get done today, like the professional stuff. Mm -hmm. And when I'm done those things, I give my bell, myself permission to just goof off, right? Wh whatever that's like. And sometimes yeah. it's just sitting and watching TV with my son or ordering takeout or gaming, whatever. And I give myself permission to do that. It doesn't matter if there are dishes in the sink or whatever. So that's, it's important. And, and it's funny because if kids who are raised like us, and I'm a codependent, I'll say I'm in codependent recovery, we, we feel guilty engaging in self-care, right? So, I mean, part of it is like, and my therapist told me, if you feel selfish, that means you're doing it right. <laughs> somebody <laughs> like you, if you feel like you're being selfish, that you're doing it right mm -hmm. because you just feel like I can't you know, feel bad asking for help. You feel bad taking care of yourself. And I had to get over that. And now I, I'm way better about recognizing when I need a break or when mm -hmm. I just need to put, you know, other things aside and focus on myself. And that's important because, I mean, we have to be around for our kids. And that means physically and emotionally. Right. We have to be 
we have to be available and that and, and we're not robots we have to take care of ourselves first yeah. yeah so when you work with clients you figure out the best mechanisms for the particular client to for example regulate emotionally yeah. and then you work with them okay and that may look different that may look different for different people okay yeah so as part of step one there are some foundational things that we talk about Okay. Um, you know, like we talked about emotional sobriety. We also talk about physical sobriety. Um, so there are a couple things like kind of, um, what do I, I like to call them like the guardrails, um, that like keep a, give us an idea of where we need to be looking. Um, but we got to figure out what works for us within those guardrails. So rather than just saying the world is your oyster, go figure it out. That can be really overwhelming and dysregulating as well. Um, but yeah, we look at, and just to clarify physical sobriety, there's a lot of things that cause us to have a stress response without ever having needed a stressor, mm -hmm. which is wild to think about. Some examples include caffeine, alcohol, sugar, right? These all can actually impact the body to reduce, uh, to release adrenaline. Yeah. So we can have a stress response yeah. in our body without ever having a stressor. Now, I'm not going to say you have to get rid of right. all of those things from your life, but it's something to notice about your experience. Maybe maybe next time you're stressed, take take an inventory. Did I exactly. have, if that, did I have a fifth cup of coffee? Maybe right. it's something to do with it. That's, I've done that. <laughs> well, why do I feel, oh yeah. <laughs> right. I drink right. coffee later than I usually would. Okay, at least I know, and that's for next time. But yeah. diet is so important now. You or it's not that it's become important recently. It, that it's always been important, but we're realizing now how important it is to mental health. Yeah. Right. I mean, I and now um, so certain people have inflammatory markers for things like gluten and things like dairy that are not allergies, but that can cause them problems that may affect physical and mental health. So it's yeah. more important than ever to kind of look to the holistic treatment. Yeah, it's Yeah, for sure. I mean, a great example of this in my life, um, and this is not my wheelhouse, I can point you in the direction to have a conversation with your doctor, but I couldn't figure out why I was experiencing kind of low mood for a while. And then next thing I knew, I got some blood work. This is physical sobriety here. And I was vitamin D insufficient. Well, vitamin D, yeah. it, creates a big impact on your mood and and your sense of well-being. Right. And so there's a lot of indicators that we can look at from a physical perspective when we're talking about stress as well. I think it's important right. to pair, okay, the circumstances of our life, our ability to emotionally regulate, but also, okay, what's going on with our physiology? Right, exactly, exactly. And that's, and if we're not getting enough outside time under the sunlight, that affects vitamin D levels too. So yes. it's important to, you know, to, um, Runs yeah, to, to, yeah, I mean, and to check all those things because if we're not treating the vitamin deficiencies for low mood, for example, the other modalities may not be as effective if the physical stuff is not being treated. Yeah, totally. No, totally. Yeah. Um, I did want to circle back to something yes. you shared because, um, I learned this term a couple years ago and I still love it, which is uh, you were talking about, you know, when you set a boundary or when you take care of yourself or you ask for something that you need, the guilt that comes up. And there's a term that I learned, I don't remember where I heard it from, but it's called afterburn. Hmm. And um, so for, for those of, I guess, those of you who are listening that, are, you know, would like a term for that, you know, oh, I just set a boundary and I'm really feeling the afterburn. Uh, it really, for me, made me feel really seen in my experience. Like, oh, though this is normal. I'm just getting a little bit of afterburn. And the more that I do these things to take care of myself, the less that this afterburn is going to show up for me. Right. No, that's that's an important point. Yeah, I never heard that term, so I'm happy to know it because I experience that all the time still. Um, that little bit of guilt, like, or that feeling like, Oh, so and so is going to be angry because yes. I'm not doing what they want. And that's from my childhood. And I had to just ride that out and eventually figure out that, yeah, people can get upset, but guess what? They get upset. And that's usually where it ends. They can't do anything, but it's, it's amazing to me how deeply rooted that is. Yeah. Right. As for codependence, it's, it's, oh, I, and I found it in my dynam dynamics with my kid, like, why am I afraid of, saying no like he's not gonna hate me forever yeah he may not be happy in that moment but our relationship is solid enough that 
it's not gonna like you know harm the relationship we had a we had a good laugh about something he was irritated with me for something i have no idea what it was could be anything and um i had like sent him an invite on an app like an uber or something you know to come to join my uber account or some other account and he was irritated with me he went to his room and i get a notification he rejected my invitation i'm like okay <laughs> And like a week later, I mentioned it to him like in passing and I kind of laughed and he laughed and he goes, I don't remember what I was upset about. I'm like, yeah, I don't either, but we had a good laugh about it. So like stuff like that happens and nothing happens to the relationship because of that. But I had to really work on myself, right? To establish the boundaries with everybody, even the really close people in my life. And yeah, it, it's it's hard. Yeah, but you have to get past that. And I tell parents, think about when you don't uphold your boundaries and you cave to other people and do things you really don't want to do, how does it feel? Oh, yeah, well, I feel crappy. I feel terrible. Right. And how do you feel when you uphold your boundary? Well, I feel good. It's scary, but I feel good. I'm like, yes. Remember how you felt when you didn't uphold your boundaries, that, mm -hmm. that you know, you felt disempowered, right? And just remember that every time you're tempted not to speak up for yourself. But it, like you said, it is a process it's not overnight, but it does, it's amazing. Like you can, you can, the more you work on it, the easier it does get. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Well, and that's why, you know, to, to circle us back, I think this is why emotional regulation is so, so important because I think that so many of us are, are walking through life. I can speak to, to myself. It's so easy for me to lose sight of what it is that I need mm -hmm. and therefore what boundaries do I even need to set to begin with? Um, what requests do I need to make of those in my life? And so for, you know, like I said, when, when we're in that lower part of the brain, we lose access to that ability to think critically, to think, to be curious, to be open to our experience of what's going on in our world, really truly as it is. And so emotionally regulating is definitely foundational to be able to figure out the rest of, of the process. Yeah. For sure, because we can't, if we're completely dysregulated, and like you said, living in that lower kind of lizard part of the brain, we can't process information, we can't retain information, we can't really critically or analytically think about things. So yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. So how, what other advice do you have for cultivating healthy relationships? I know we've talked about a lot of different things, but both parent-child relationships and adult relationships, because as I'm, as I'm always telling parents, you know, children's model for relationships are the relationships of the parents um, and the relationship between the children and the adults in the household. Now, those are the models the kids take with them into adulthood. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we talked about the stress less method, at least the very first step of it. Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, that oftentimes comes up as part of the stress less method, step four, which is remove your blocks. Um, this is where we learn a lot of new skills and we're, we're adding things to our toolbox to create a different experience uh, in our life. One of the tools that I teach is something called safe conversations. And this is not something that I created. The founders are Harvel Hendricks and Helen LaKelly Hunt, world renowned relational experts, something that I'm certified in. And, you know, one of the things that they talk about and is important to, to think about when we're talking about our relationships across the board is what, well, first they, they really in their work were striving to answer one question. And that question was, why do people fight? Why do we, why do we fight with other people? And what they found was, is that the, the reason, the number one reason no, the, the, the reason, not even the number one, the reason that people fight is objection to difference. Hmm. And so if we can think about, you know, think back at some, back to some of our most recent disagreements or arguments, it, it was that objection to that other person having a different opinion or a different experience or a different outlook. And so what can happen when we object to difference is the number one killer of relationships comes out and it's it's our it's the lizard part of the brain right the reptilian part of the brain it's the reaction and the reaction is negativity 
And so negativity is anything that could be experienced as a put down. It could be an eye roll, it could be, you know, so body language, it could be tone of voice, it could be the actual words that you're speaking. Um, but the key is, is that the person receiving it is, is it, they're experiencing it as a put down. So my recommendation when we're talking about being a, a wonderful role model in our parental relationship and then also our relationship, uh, well I should say like romantic relationship and our relationship with our children is strive for zero negativity. Now it's a feat, believe me, it is a feat, but it's a worthy pursuit. It's really something that's worthy because when we remove negativity from our relationships as much as we can, what we're preventing is we're pre preventing that fight, flight, or freeze response. We're preventing the reptilian brain from coming online. We're preventing the reactions from other people and ourselves creates a healthier brain for ourselves. And we're role modeling what a healthy relationship really looks like. Now that doesn't mean you can't express your grievances. You absolutely right. can and you should, right. but it's about how you're expressing those grievances that really matters. So, um, and that's really where the safe conversations dialogue process comes in. It shows us the how. How do we express those grievance, grievances? How do we express our experience? How do we receive, this is as, as parents is so important, how, how do we receive news from our children or information from our children that we don't know what to do with, that is triggering for our own experience and our own emotional wounds? It's the how. And it's one of the best tools that I, I've ever learned in my in my life for my relationships. Yeah, that sounds like um like avoiding anything that resembles contempt. Mm. Right. Yeah. One of the that's, four that's, horsemen. That's, that's, exactly. <laughs> that's exactly right. That's, that's where that's what I thought of when you yeah. started talking about that. Four yeah, and horsemen. it's yeah. right. Four or five horsemen, yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, and contempt is like one of the wor the worst, supposedly, right? Yeah, like eye rolls, you know, the the sighing, the dramatic sighing, all those things together can signify contempt, especially, you know, adolescents and teens are very sensitive. Again, that's just normal brain development for where they are. Very sensitive, man, and and they and so many things they accept as criticism or contempt, even if it's not the intention, right? Or to it, or maybe an adult would not accept it the same way because an adult is just hopefully more emotionally aware, right? Uh, and emotionally sophisticated. But yeah, that's, that's really important. I um, work with a parenting coach who specializes in like conscious conversations mm. with kids. And one of the, the things she teaches is right, how to communicate with kids in a way that is that you're providing them guidance. You're not dictating to them. You're not criticizing. You're not telling them what to do. You're providing guidance in a way that they may be receptive to it. And that's, yeah, that's, it's, it's much more, um, you know, it's much more likely that, that kids, adolescents and teens mostly are going to accept what the parent is communicating if it is presented as guidance or here's what may work for you or here's what's worked for me in the past. And I'm doing that right now with like the mindfulness, the stress reduction techniques you're talking about, right? You know, well, this worked for me. I'm not going to meditate. Okay. Well, it's <laughs> fine. I'm not going to do yoga. Okay. It's fine. You know, then go outside and, you know, play football or something. But, um, <laughs> but like, I mean, it's, it's tough because, you know, parents, you know, in my position, like we, we know things that work for stress reduction, right? For example, but teaching them to the kids, sometimes kids of a certain age are not as receptive. So we need to learn, learn to, like you said, regulate ourselves and let go of a lot of that and just keep introducing them, them to things so that they hopefully figure out what works for them eventually. Yeah. But yeah, all of these things together are really important. Yeah, yeah for and, sure. Um, yeah. Holding that, being that safe space for our kids to come to us. Right at the end of the day. They may not take our advice, but maybe one day they'll they'll feel safe enough to actually ask for the advice and right. receive it. And that's right. the goal, is to be able to have um, our kids be able to feel safe enough to come to us and actually ask and therefore be willing to receive. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's all I could do. Right, hope. And, you know, look, this day and age, 
there is so much information that is readily available that was not available when we were kids. I mean, you're younger than me, but it was definitely not available. I grew up in a rural county. There was no internet. I couldn't just go and figure out, oh, this is gaslighting. This is traumatic or this is a toxic dynamic. I had no idea. And now, you know, my 14 year old is like, oh yeah, we're watching a movie. And he's like, that's gaslighting. I'm like, yeah, how did you know that? <laughs> well, I know what gaslighting is. I'm like, what is it? And he explained it to me. I'm like, okay, you do know what gaslighting is. <laughs> I mean, kids are like light years ahead of where, you know, adults my age were at their, at their age, at their, mm. that time. So it's, um, I mean, and that's a good, I mean, that's a good thing. Just the availability of the information, it's empowering. But like you said, there's so much information coming at us that that's overwhelming. So that's where yes. the paring down the whole less is more. That's where that becomes important is, yes. you know, knowing what to focus on and what to just. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, how to let the noise settle down and get the information yeah. that you need. That exactly. is the thing that I see is that we have access to so much information that it can actually create more internal chaos of mm -hmm. questioning ourselves mm -hmm. and our experience because, well, this expert says this and that expert says this and yeah. this article said that and this TikTok right. thing said this, you know. Right, right. And, and right. what do I think? Well, I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, that's tough. It's tough even for adults. Yeah, so imagine for like teens with the developing brain. It's cra <laughs> that's crazy. Right. Um, Carly, what services do you provide? Uh, so you do one-on-one -on -one coaching? Do you do group coaching? Do you do webinars? Yeah, so I offer one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, I have you know, a couple different programs, all of them work the stress less method. It's okay. foundational. Um, and then every so often I will offer a um, public workshop, safe conversations workshop. Mm -hmm. So if you want to follow along, you can uh, go to my website, get on my newsletter. So you know about when that might come up, but great. Yes. Yep. And we will put your contact information, on your website in the video description, but you could go ahead and what's the website uh, people could go to. Yeah, you know what, now that I'm thinking, I think a great place to start since we talked about zero negativity today mm -hmm. is um, Safe Conversations has a beautiful 30 day zero negativity challenge. Could be a really great place to start. Yeah. So if you want to check that out, learn more about what, what it means to remove negativity from your life, I would say go to stresslessco.com slash zero negativity. And you can download that free guide and that would be a really beautiful place to start. Oh, that would be awesome. Thank you so much. That's yeah. I will I am definitely gonna do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love I it. You always use less negativity, you know, always. <laughs> so yeah, so um is there before we start to wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to share with parents today that we haven't covered? You know, I think that like I said earlier, if it feels um like it's impossible. Um, trust that if you take one little baby step at a time that one little truth is going to be revealed and then one more little truth is going to be revealed and then one more and one more and I promise you that you'll look back and you'll say whoa wait hold on a second <laughs> I didn't even realize I made progress progress can happen um, oftentimes we just we don't we don't quite see it so there's hope is what I'm getting at. <laughs> Thank you. That's very, that's a great message to leave on today. Cause it's sometimes when we're in the middle of it, like mired in the day to day, we don't see the progress until we can, you know, detach ourselves and be like, Oh, we did. I did. I handled this way better than I would have six months ago. Right. So that's a very important point. Thank you so much. This has been a really great conversation. I really appreciate you coming on. I'm going to put all of Carly's uh, contact information in the video description. Um, and please join us in the, uh, the uh, safe conversations challenge, uh, negativity challenge to eradicate as much negativity as possible. That will be wonderful. <laughs> Can't wait to start that. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on today. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And uh, to the audience, I will be back with a new video uh, in just a few days. And uh, our parting note, we are literally eight subscribers away from monetizing this channel. So if you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe, please share with your friends. And my sister and I will be doing a live Q&A as soon as we monetize this channel. You will not want to miss that because my sister is hilarious. Uh, thank you guys very much. And thank you to Carly. And I'll see you guys soon.